हाय वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून सभी को नमस्कार ए वॉम वेलकम टू द ट्वेंटी वर्ल्ड एजुकेशन समिट हायर एजुकेशन ऑन द फर्स्ट डे ट्वेंटी सेकेंड सेप्टेम्बर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन हियर वी आर कम विद मोर एस्टीम स्पीकर रिनोन स्पीकर एजुकेशनिस्ट इन द हायर एजुकेशन आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम प्रोफेसर राव भूमिदारी प्रेसिडेंट इंस्टीट्यूट ऑफ एडवांस रिसर्च गांधीनगर वेलकम राव सर वेलकम टू द वर्ल्ड एजुकेशन समिट थैंक यू फॉर गिविंग यूर प्रीसियस टाइम टू अस so i would like to know that audience that rao sir is giving the insights inputs regarding the national education policy 2020 and university governance in this through an national education policy so i request all my audience if you have any questions regarding the nep regarding the government what is approaches how the opportunity what are challenges please be free ask your question to the rao sir he just bring some Please, time for the precious time for World Education Summit. So please put your question. We will take it live during the session. So Rao sir, not taking much time, I will hand over this virtual desk to you, sir. So it's all over you, sir, Rao sir. Once this presentation will be done, we will take the Q and A session, sir. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Tomar. Uh, thank you. It's, uh, I'm delighted to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity to share my. views over the next 10 12 minutes so that leave time for some questions so i'm going to <clears throat> focus primarily on the role of governance in the context of the new uh, national education policy uh, everything starts with really governance in terms of whether it is a corporate body or a university or even a school governance is critical in order to ensure the vision ethos strategy they are all rightly uh, set and then um, the the institution and its operations are supervised so let me share my presentation with you uh, and then i will highlight a few points which i would like to make during this presentation so i've been part of this world education summit for a while for the last 3 years i think uh, i've been talking about various topics um uh, i spent some 40 years abroad uh, working in various universities in different countries uh, including running a large university uh, so i learned a few things from different places and now the task of course is how do we adapt some of those good practices uh to indian context as we uh, uh move into this new uh, paradigm of national education policy and its objectives so oh it's not moving let me see okay so if you look at where we are um over the last 20 years there has been a, a substantive shift in the higher education world in india it has grown substantially to some thousand universities 400 or so private universities some 50000 colleges majority of them are private um each institution has its own mission vision Uh, and purpose uh, then funding of these institutions is also very diverse multiple funding sources individual families corporate bodies government of course and so on um then at the same time because of this it revolution people are better informed students the parents uh, the guardians they are better informed about what is available um the objectives of higher education and so on so the stakeholders their expectations have changed substantially in the last two decades then the political context <clears throat> as i said the national education policy is new uh it's extremely ambitious um and uh, new regulatory re agencies are under development Uh, so the whole whole context is changing politically 
decision making is an issue the transparency <clears throat> has uh, uh, is difficult to see so the opacity of decision making creates challenges for individual individual institutions and and its leaders and and it's a very important issue it's the increasing burden of compliance on institutions uh, every week we receive a letter from ugc from uh, state government departments um, um, ministry of higher education ministry of education or mhrd uh, asking to submit this or that so the institutions have got a lot of compliance burden so if i then progress to actually look at looking at the nep itself i just want you to focus on a, the vision there have been so many webinars on nep so i am not going to talk about details of nep but i think it is important we look at that vision it's a fantastic vision it's india centered education system that contributes directly to transforming our na nation sustainably into an equitable vibrant knowledge society by providing high quality education to all now that's a huge agenda so, so there are key words if you like one is transformation india centered sustainable equitable knowledge society and education to all now these these are very important um words uh, and if you read the nep uh, the entire document actually is developed based on this vision um, a very impressive document very ambitious document and um, the task now is to consider what are the next steps how we are going to actually implement those um, so if i quickly focus on what it is the institutions are being asked to do under the national education policy um, the the objectives are large multidisciplinary education um, uh, systems so the current 50000 or 1000 universities 50000 colleges they are all supposed to be uh, merged if you like or evolved into 15000 large multidisciplinary educational institutions A and that involves a lot of things you know, merging of institutions uh diversifying the disciplinary focus of the institutions and so on the scale and autonomy are also emphasized in the document india centric and holistic flexible education uh that has got lots and lots of implications to what we are currently doing governance is targeted to be autonomous independent boards so i will focus particularly on that issue but i am setting a context for you for governance accessibility to all sections of society apologies for that um multiple entry exit points so it's a hop on and hop off system that's what the nep wants us to develop it says light but tight regulation sorry that's a spelling mistake there uh, light but tight regulation for financial probity accreditation and regulation so these are really the key aspects of the new um, education policy uh, um we have had so many education policies commissions um white papers issued but for some reason i have reason to believe this time it will be implemented it will be implemented i think it is it should be implemented for in the best interests of our country our young people the quality of our education system i share with you this um, pictorial description the universities are all not one there are all, all kinds of universities in india we have iits we have got agricultural universities we have got colleges technical colleges liberal arts colleges jawaharlal Jawa nehru university so they are all very different kinds of institutions so let me perhaps focus on what makes an institution what it is and what it can be 
So if you look at, there are two bold phrases I use, faculty and staff participation. Faculty and staff participation in the organization, in the management of the university. And on the left side, we have the empowered organization. Is it a dictatorial system or actually people are encouraged, enabled to do their work? So it's a very important issue. So within that, if you look at depending on which one is high and which one is low, we end up with different kinds of universities. If you have high staff and faculty participation and if staff and faculty are empowered to a very high degree, then I describe that as an enlightened university. If you go to say, for example, a university like uh, Oxford, Oxford is a con conglomeration of colleges, but each college uh, is organized in a very similar way. So they are enlightened. It's run by a group of colleagues. It's collegial. Um, if actually the faculty and staff participation is high, but they're not as empowered, we end up with an efficient and effective organization, um, well uh, directed rules, regulations, everything is in place, um, but faculty and staff have an ownership of what they're doing. So we have an, an efficient and effective university. A, an example for that might be, uh, I'm from UK, so I'll give you a UK example. You might have heard university name Warwick University. So it probably fits in that. Or if you go to US, uh, California Institute of Technology. So, but then if you go to uh, the bottom uh, two quadrants, on the left side, if the empowerment is low and staff and faculty are not um, engaged in managing and running the university, then it basically becomes chaotic, ineffective, inefficient. Nobody takes ownership for anything. Everybody is basically going through motions, if you like. They are pretending they're doing their job. And on the right side, um, there are many universities in the world which are overmanaged. That is uh, low empowerment and low staff uh, engagement. But it is basically managed from the top. From in India, what we call founders in private universities or in some universities abroad, the management boards. So, um, you have got if you, a, a vice chancellor who ten, has got dictatorial tendencies or the university boards which um, take executive function rather than governance function. So they're overmanaged. Then they become very less creative organizations. Um, the work is done, but it is, if you like, uh, uh, robotic organizations. This, this I want to share with you because this is what we end up with if we don't get the governance formula right. So what is governance? What does it do? I mean, it's uh, governance is actually, uh, uh, there are two things. One is governance, the other is management. The two are different, but heavily interlinked. There is a fine line between the two. And it's very important for governors not to cross that boundary and management not to pretend to be governing. So that requires knowledge, experience, understanding of governance and management. So governors are supposed to be ensuring the clar clarity of vision and strategic direction of the university. Um, holding the leadership to account, accountable for all operations of the university, performance of the university, whether it is academic or research, which is the primary function, if you like. Um, then effective and efficient use of resources. How well is the money being used? Is it correctly being deployed? That's all governance function. So they are supposed to oversee, not decide, 
but oversee and comment on. And compliance is governance responsibility. Um, at currently, many universities, if you go and talk to faculty or staff, unless they're members of the governing board or they have directly something to do with governance, they would have no clue of what a governance board is, what do they do. Uh, they might have heard, some of them might have heard about governing board of, board of governors, but they're distant. Governing boards are very distant from the universities and the body of university, main body of university. But the compliance is the responsibility of governing boards if they, if they are autonomous and independent boards. The financial performance is very important. The governing body, if you like, is observing the operations from uh, a little bit from a distance. So they, it's their job to make sure the money is being deployed correctly. The financial regulations, rules, they're all followed. The audit is working correctly and so on. Inclusivity, which is a key term we found in the NEP vision, um, is, is, is critical. That whatever the university does is accessible to uh, all sections of society. So what does a good governance uh, might be? Um, so a good governance, governing board champions the vision of the university. It sets the ethos, defines the ethos of the organization and its strategy. It focuses on accountability in order to drive up academic standards and of course, financial probity. So what is important is the governing body or governing board is made up of people with right skills. These right skills uh, range. There's a range of right skills needed, whether it is to do with finance, legal, business mindset, industry, research focus, and also, of course, educational experience. So the governing board has to contain all these uh, skills and expertise. Um, the compliance with statutory and contractual requirements is a regular uh, function of the governing board. And so the governing board must organize itself as subcommittees in order to deliver these responsibilities. And these subcommittees must have those specific skills. As is the case with, say, for example, if you go to a large, successful multinational corporate body, um, they also have the same things. They, we are different. Universities are different from corporate business bodies in that um, we are interlinked with society. We are part of the society. So the, the, the distance between uh, society, social impact, and the university uh, is not visible as opposed to corporate bodies. So we have a, a little more complexity in governing the organizations. So what are the implications of this NEP on uh, the governance of institutions? So the, the increased scrutiny of governing boards will be in place. It has to be in place. If they're autonomous and independent, somebody has to oversee them as well. Um, so there will be regulatory system in place in order to oversee the governing bodies, where governing boards, whether they are doing their job properly or not. Professionalization. At the moment, the governing boards, uh, if you look at uh, a range of them, are not generalizing. Uh, there may be um, governing boards which are operating perfectly. Um, my experience in India is limited, so I can't be absolutely certain. But uh, we have some fantastic institutions. I'm sure governing, governance is working very well. But generally, we have a long way to go. So the governing boards have to be professionalized. Uh, people have to take their roles 
uh, and responsibilities a lot more seriously. It's not three or four meetings. Uh, uh, and if you like a day out, quote unquote, from their day jobs, uh, they, they have a responsibility for the university and the well-being of the university, its faculty, staff, and its students. Um, so it, it, it is an important job to be a governor of the university. Training and development. The governors currently don't have any training or development. How to be a governor? What are their responsibilities? If you look at uh, large corporate bodies, the independent directors of these organizations have got training. They are given training how to be um, a director because director has got legal responsibilities. Currently in the universities, we don't have that. We have to develop that. If we want professionalized, responsible governing bodies, we need to help the governors with appropriate training and development. The matrix of expertise and skills, which I already referred to, finance, legal, education, business, management, industry, and government. So we need representatives from these sectors on the governing board. We also need a good code of good, a code of good practice for governors. So all governors uh, take cognizance of such a code of practice. And what is important uh, equally is a self-reflection. At least once a year, each governing board must reflect on itself. Are they doing their job properly? Where they can improve? Where there are gaps? And so on. But there is a fundamental principle behind all this for governance. Um, as I said, there is a fine line between governance and management. So I summarize this by saying governance is eyes on. So we should always be keeping an eye on what's happening, but hands off. We shouldn't interfere and do it. If you like, manage the finance or manage the compliance or um, manage education provision directly. So the governors have to keep an eye on the organization continuously but they shouldn't interfere with the operations. So that's, if you like, the principle of governance. But underneath that, lots of issues that I shared previously. So I, I stop there and then pick up any questions, comments. Thank you, Rao, sir, for this wonderful presentation. So there's some questions from the audience side. So I will ask on behalf of them. So Rao, sir, first question is that, is national education policy 2020 is sufficient enough to bring Indian higher education system to the global standards? Fantastic question. No, answer is absolutely no. National education policy is policy. For any policy uh, to be realized, we need an implementation plan. How do we actually implement this policy? There are so many things. Um, the, uh, the key words I uh, captured in early on in my presentation. If we want, if we are to rec realize those, we need the right faculty. The faculty are not trained to be teachers for a start. We appoint faculty because they have a PhD and a long list of publications. As though they are actually simply career researchers. So we need faculty, systematic faculty development. We need management and leadership in organizations. Who are our middle managers, heads of departments, deans, vice chancellors, provosts? They are all basically, we promote them, experienced people who learned on the job, if you like. That's good. Good people learn on the job, but that is not sufficient. We also need a systematic development program. If you go to China, there is a college there, National Academy of Education Administration, NAEA -E -N -A -E -A, in Beijing. I teach there. Whenever I'm in Beijing, if there is a program going on, they invite me to teach there. 
um, every dean, every vice president, every president of the university, the president there basically is vice chancellor, um, is trained. They are trained for ranging from two weeks to three months. Uh, the key issues of management and so on. We need a college like that. We have uh, administrative staff colleges in India, I think. But really, they are not there to uh, train vice chancellors or deans and so on. So we need a college, maybe number of colleges like that. That that college also should actually include governors, governance training. Then there are issues related to resourcing. There is a cost to all this. It's a huge transformation. It's a paradigm shift and it costs. At the moment, uh, uh, investment in higher education is very limited, 0 0.65, whatever it is in research, of course. Uh, the education investment is not too bad, but um, are we getting value for it is the question. So the, the accountability has to be improved as well. So there are lots Perfect. of things to be done in order to realize the policy. Perfect. And the next question is from the Sivran Sarda University Greater Noida. Physically and digitally, what does the university of future look like? What type of institutions will survive in future? Right. So the the institutions, uh, it's 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 not as though an institution is cast in stone. It has never been. Institutions have always been evolving. They have always been learning. So this uh, IT revolution is not going to. Uh, completely transform the universities in any way. It's just that universities have to learn to exploit the technology. So it, it, the technology will enhance what universities have been doing rather than replace what universities have been doing. Mm -hmm. So I've, my projection is universities as they are will still be there. But the universe, the successful universities are those which will exploit the emerging IT and indeed other technologies. That's the right. whole whole issue related to data, universities are full of data hmm. for tens of years, for centuries in some cases. We do nothing with that data. We should be using that data um, uh, on how to improve the university. So universities are successful universities will exploit the technology, learn these new tools of data analytics and so on uh, and Perfect. continue to improve. Perfect inputs Rao sir and one last question that is coming from Rahul Saini, SRM University Chennai. What trend shift has you seen over the past few years in terms of learning? what technology is playing in helping institute and student for outcome based learning so mainly rahul is asking sir regarding the trend shift and the impact of technologies on the students and the faculty part great rahul, thank sir, you what? this is yes. an area of my particular interest it is the whole education system uh, has become very linear um, the ch all children are born creative and we actually remove that creativity to our educate through our education system. So we have we have to actually look at how do we redesign the curriculum and the delivery of curriculum in order to enhance the outcomes of student learning. So it is to do with if you like discipline knowledge uh, with uh, degrees of freedom for creativity but also bringing the two into a context. The context, if you like, is the society and the business world. Linking those three is very important. Uh, that's a very big topic. I do not want to get mm. into that's my hobby. I don't want to uh, get onto my hobby horse, if you like. Uh, mm. But I think we do need to actually, the NEP touches on that, in fact. It talks about holistic education. It talks about liberal arts, inclusion of liberal arts education. Um, and it also talks about creativity. So um, we do need to reinvent the curriculum design and delivery. So uh, the answer to that question is basically we need to move away from rigid UGC curriculum, um, AICTE curriculum uh, as it currently stands, 
but uh, improve those curriculum and uh, leave some degrees of freedom to add other com components, whether they are to do with the design thinking or to do with even music, a course in music. Music has got most degrees of freedom compared to any other learning. So we need to rethink. Uh, it's 75% uh, of a degree program may be structured curriculum, but at least we should leave about 25% for liberal arts, for design mm -hmm. thinking, for mm -hmm. creativity, and so on. Perfect. So thank you, Rao, sir. Actually, we are on the time, sir. And thank you very much for giving your precious time to us and lining us. And I request all my audience that Rao, sir, has much more experience and much more expertise in many segments, in admissions, in any higher education aspect. If you want to take the expertise, kindly contact to Rao, sir. You can follow Rao, sir, on his social handle as well. If you want to stay updated regarding the innovation, regarding the initiative in the higher education, in any global education, please follow Rao sir on the social handles. If you have any query, any relevant query, please ping him. If the query is relevant, he will get back to you. And if you want to use the expertise in your ed tech segment, in your any new universities open, the Rao sir is much more open to help you in, in this. So if any other questions, we will send Rao sir in mail. If Rao sir has the time, he will revert to us. Then we will get back to you. Till then, I will thank Rao sir by giving his precious time to us and enlightening to us. So I a small token of appreciation from our side. I request Rajeshwar to please hand over the speaker certificate to Professor Rao Bamidari, President Institute of Advanced Research from Gandhinagar. Thank you, Rao sir. Thank you very much for giving your precious time to us. And Thank any you. special Thank message, Rao sir, to our audience, sir, from your side. Thank you very much indeed, everyone. Uh, it's, it's great to interact. And uh, my objective is to continue to share my knowledge and experience. So I would be delighted to be uh, accessible. Uh, you can contact me anytime. Thank you. Thank you, Rao sir. Thank you. Namaskar, sir.